Hi everybody, welcome to week five. And this week we wanna talk about this idea of problem definition. And so recall last week, we, we talked about this idea of narrative policy analysis and really thinking of ways we, we frame policies. And the discussion was that the, the, the way we frame the policy actually can affect how we define it as a policy problem, if you will. So one of the purposes of talking about this in this week, in week five, is that in week six, the next major element of your project is due, and that is writing up your problem definition. So we want to talk about it this week, and, and that gives you time to really think about how, how you're going to write up the, this part, this major part, really, of your, your policy analysis project. So remember last week we talked about policy narratives and we used social security as our example. And so I would like to now, a week into this, acknowledge that, um, you know, some people might think of this as sort of fringe thinking, right? So we, you might have something of a rationalist bent and say that really that's not how we should look at policy. We should look at policy as this rational approach uh, to solving a problem. But the telling of stories, I would assert, and other people assert, um, is is really what is part of makes making us human, right? Um, so think of the old Indiana Jones movies, Raiders of the Lost Ark, which are kind of classic movies, right? So Indiana Jones was um, also known as Professor Henry Jones Jr. in a university, and 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 he is quoted in one movie at the beginning of one movie saying that archaeology is the study of fact, not truth. If it's truth you want, you can go to the professor down the hall who teaches philosophy. Um, but then Indiana Jones, the treasure hunter, goes out in search of stories about fact. Um, and so archaeology, in a sense, is really trying to find the stories that ancient people, people before us, um, we're trying to tell about how they lived. And what archaeologists do is recreate that story in many senses, right? Through the discovery of fact, through the discovery of layers of cities and the artifacts that they find in those cities, the pottery, the furniture, um, the way the doors and windows were constructed. And so all those things, all those physical facts lead them really to being able to tell a story about how these particular groups of people lived. And so, um, it, you know, without knowing it, we do this all the time, right? Um, nonprofits and government organizations tell their story and they deliver messages, for example, on their website. So they often even do this with the name of their organization. So you think of the Red Cross, that has some connotation to you beyond the the name of that organization the name tells you a story and for different people it might be a different story but we also use shorthand to identify uh, kind of well-developed narratives when we talk about big ideas right um, and sometimes we don't even really have that much knowledge of the antecedent conditions so um, you know we talk about this character Ebenezer Scrooge the main character from um, Charles Dickens' famous novel, A Christmas Carol, right? And so we describe someone as Ebenezer Scrooge, and we pack all kinds of meaning into that story um, that we really don't have to, you know, we don't have to say a lot else about it because that carries some connotation. Um, we could use the term North Korea, and, and especially if we set off North Korea versus South Korea, and we just say that, we're actually telling a, a completely different story about two countries really occupying the same peninsula, um, pe people who are, uh, you know, ethnically and culturally related to each other um, with two very different governments. And, and if we just say North Korea, we get this image of a repressive kind of Stalinist state where people are thrown into prison literally for 
um, not smiling correctly when the dear leader passes by. And so we, we drum up these images in our mind. Um, or what about the term Declaration of Independence or the Constitution? These tell stories in and of themselves. And so we kind of use policy narratives a lot and we can say these things about policy as well. We can talk, we can say the word SNAP, what used to be known as food stamps. And that drums up some kind of story in your mind. We could use social security, which I use a lot. Um, we can say um, the term ICE, the uh, Immigrations and Customs Enforcement. And so that tells different stories to different people. And so we do this a lot. So um, some common policies where we've used narratives, and again, this is a little bit of review, but look at these policy areas I put on the left-hand side of this chart. Welfare, national defense, fossil fuels and energy, uh, national education standards. And so we have these competing narratives, for example, in welfare. Um, the welfare queen in quotes versus the mother in need of a hand up national defense um sort of a story of peace through strength versus the military industrial complex fossil fuels um transition from polluting energy versus using our natural resources for america national educational standards um improving national education outcomes versus maintaining local control of schools and so we can see that in each of these policy areas we can have at least a couple of competing narratives and probably more and often these stories have taglines that that go with the stories taglines are subtitles if you will that kind of go with the story and when people use those taglines they pack a lot of meaning into their view and their maybe even back of the napkin analysis of what that policy is all about so that's a review and, and but well the reason i review that is because again the the idea is that it's really important to translating that into problem definition what really is the problem definition and so again social security which is this huge this huge policy area what is the problem with social security policy problem well you can sit down with a piece of paper and you could probably think of 10 or so policy problems with social security. And so it's important to understand how you got there to defining the policy. So this week, I kind of want to take a more uh, concrete approach to the problem definition. And that is, I want you to use the Nebraska unicameral website. So for those of you who live in Nebraska, you know that we have a one house legislature called we commonly call the unicameral. Um, for those of you who don't live in Nebraska, now you know. Um, we don't have a House and Senate at the state level. Um, so I'm asking you to use their website, the Nebraska Unicameral's website, to look at some specific policies that have been set by the legislature to see if you can tease out the, uh, a problem definition from bills that have been passed and bills that are under consideration. And so you're gonna you're gonna see where I'm going with this after I describe what I want you to use in the um, the website itself. So um, again, this kind of relates to your project because for purposes of the class, we're using this step-by-step -step approach to the policy analysis project because what I want you to do is I want you to move from the idea that there's a broad policy area to a specific policy and then clearly understand what it is you're trying to analyze. And so in order to do that, look at that specific policy problem. There's going to be alternatives that answer your policy problem, right? You're not just going to simply report on the policy for the project. And then your, your problem definition is going to set up means of measuring the outcome or some means of comparing these policy alternatives. So all of this is done step by step in, in kind of this logical, rational approach because it helps you to really sort of break down the policy into its component parts and then analyze it. So this is a review from the reading. So this is from the Bardak text, uh, their famous Eightfold Path, right? That's the subtitle of the book, The Eightfold Path. So again, The Eightfold Path, this isn't the way I organize the paper, but it's a way of thinking. It's a way of thinking through policy analysis.
So notice they start, we've discussed this, but they start with define the problem, right? So that's really, really super important. And that's why uh, I start with defining the problem. And then you're going to assemble evidence, then construct your alternatives, select the criteria that you measure those alternatives by, um, project the outcomes of those alternatives, and then look at trade-offs, and then sort of stop where you're at and go back and reconsider. And then finally, once you've done all that, really tell the story of this policy problem, right? So again, think of the Bardak text not really as the way, way of organizing a paper, but a way of thinking through the policy problem. So um, when we make a problem statement, um, it's a it's a definition issue, right? It's an exercise in defining terms. Um, and so what does that mean? So when you think of the dictionary, um, when the dictionary defines words, you you see how a dictionary, a standard dictionary breaks up words, right? It tells you the part of speech it is. It tells you how the word is pronounced. It might tell you um, what language that word might have come from. It will give you several definitions. And so you can read that definition of that word and then you, you actually see all this logic behind why the word is defined that way. So when you write a problem definition, you want others to see your logic. So you could state a problem in terms of market failure, as we've discussed. You could state a problem in terms of social failure. You could state a problem in terms of government failure, right? So those are all different ways of finding sort of a deficit in uh, the, the approach to the problem, right? Um, so Bardak asks you to be careful with issue rhetoric. And what, so what are they talking about there? They're talking about kind of putting the cart before the horse, right? Um, they're talking about just jumping immediately to using rhetoric to, to describe your problem in a way that makes it more emotional and less analytical. So you, you really want people to see your logic. Some other hints, right? You have to recognize there's uncertainty. Um, you have to try to quantify your problem if possible. And, and sometimes it's not possible, but you can quantify your problem. I'm not talking about um, using some sophisticated statistical measure. I'm talking about um, simple quantification. You know, we could say, you know, a certain percentage of people are uninsured versus insured. Um, you might start diagnosing conditions, why that problem occurred. Um, you might start looking at opportunities. So one pitfall that is talked about um, is starting to smuggle in your solution already when you're defining the problem. That's that's really, that's one you have to think about because it's kind of hard not to do. So again, craft has the, the, these five steps, right? Um, this is kind of closer to the way I organize the paper, um, the five-step model. Um, so it actually takes out some steps, some contemplative steps, if you will, from Bardak. Um, so this this path is really, again, kind of the standard approach. I would I might call the thesis approach, but it but it's closer to how uh, I've designed the paper. So define again. So what is the nature of the problem, and and what is the problem in context? Measure right. So quantify the problem. Third, determine the extent or the magnitude of the problem, right? Then think about causes and then start to set goals and objectives and then determine what is done. And so that gets us into the realm of feasibility. So all this time, what I'm talking about here is actually defining a problem. So here, I'm actually going to ask you to go to the PowerPoint version of this um, lecture. And so what I want you to do in the PowerPoint version of the lecture is click on these links. And if you do that, you can see um, what I'm talking about here. There's different ways of defining a problem. So I have a couple slides here where I wanna say there's a problem with healthcare. So if I just said there's a problem with healthcare, I really haven't given you a problem definition, have I? I've just really 
I, I'm just very, being very broad in saying there's a problem with healthcare. Well, what is the problem? So one problem might be that catastrophic healthcare is unaffordable. So the example might be early stage breast cancer allowable amounts cost an average of about $73,000 for a 36 month treatment regimen. So is that affordable? And so what this article talks about is the problem with that. Let me click on that link. And so here you have a, um, this is um, an article that talks about this very thing, the cost of uh, long-term treatment regimen. So let me go back to my um, PowerPoint here. So that's one, one problem definition with healthcare, right? Uh, that um, catastrophic healthcare is unaffordable. Another problem might be a large number of non-elderly persons are uninsured. So about 44 million in 2013, about 27.4 million in 2017 after the um, passage of the Affordable Care Act. So um, where do I get this information? And this is a good example of a table that quantifies things in a simple way. So take a look at this table. Um, I'm sorry, the table's coming up. I, this article talks about facts about the uninsured population. And you notice the article is written in 2019. So what this article is talking about is uh, our key, key data on the uninsured population. And so the article goes on to talk about uninsured rates. There's a table or chart, bar chart there that talks about the number of uninsured and the uninsured rate among the non-elderly, that is people younger than 65, the non-elderly population. So another way we might think about um, a problem in healthcare is, in terms of insurance, we have a somewhat confusing array of coverages in the US. So is that a problem? Well, it might be. So this is the table. This is from Kaiser Family Foundation. So look at this chart. It's the United States, then every state in the, in the Union. And what this table tells us is the percentages of people in each state and the, the kinds of insurance they have. So you see it talks about the percentage of people with employer-based insurance the percentage of people with non-group based insurance, the percentage of people on using Medicaid, the percentage of people using Medicare, the percentage of people who are military and using military insurance, the percentage of people who are uninsured. And so this all adds up to 100% at the end. So you might define a problem in healthcare as sort of this somewhat confusing array of different kinds of insurance. So let's move on. There's other problems with healthcare, right? There's a shortage of rural physicians. And so for this one, I referenced a piece of journalism from US News and World Report. Um, this was uh, filed, this story was filed in 2018. I'm not gonna read it to you, but it's called Wanted Rural Doctors. So it defines a problem in healthcare as a shortage of rural doctors. Um, again, another kind of shortage story um, a shortage of primary care doctors. And so this piece of journalism um, talks about a, sh a shortage of primary care physicians and the impact that will have on healthcare. The last one um, talks about the obesity rate among uh, persons in the United States. So in excess of 30% of people are obese, and less than 25% of adults exercise regularly. I won't click on the articles because you're kind of getting the idea where I'm going here. Um, but these articles back up what I say is a problem statement with healthcare. Um, one more example. So inattentive driving. So if I say inattentive driving is a problem, well, is that really a problem statement for me to say inattentive driving is a problem? We might think of actually making this more specific. So I might say when a driver is inattentive to road conditions, they can veer into other lanes or fail to slow or stop the car when required. I might say inattentive driving might be caused by several things like using handheld, a handheld device while driving, tuning the radio, eating while driving, talking to other occupants. So um, there's a YouTube video there that if you go to the um, 
I'm not going to click on that, but if you go to the PowerPoint version of this, you, you can click on that link and see this YouTube video about inattentive driving. Kind of drives the message home. But how would we measure it? Well, we might measure it by obtaining official accident statistics from the state or the federal government and look for listed causes. How do we determine magnitude? Because I talked about this earlier, determining magnitude of the problem. You actually, in some of this data, you can see the percentage of accidents in which inattentive driving was seen as causal by the investigating agency. And that would give you percentages. For example, um, you know, in 10% of the cases, inattentive driving was seen as a, a causal. Um, by the way, you could, you know, you could look at driving statistics and the use of restraint devices or safety belts and fatalities. And so um, these help you, uh, these help you make your, your problem statement um, more specific. And so what's our goal in this case? Our goal really is to find the best ways to prevent drivers from engaging in inattentive driving, right? And we can figure out what's feasible from there. And so that's all problem. And so I'm kind of jumping ahead here, but, but that's okay. Um, because this kind of gets to our next step was, is when we start thinking about alternatives to our problem, right? So it's important at this juncture, just to think about alternatives, not necessarily what they are specifically, but ways in which alternatives can be implemented by the government. And so it's important to, to, remember, and I think most of you know this, but it's important to remember that government does not always directly deliver the policy solution. So when we say that a policy was made by a government, whether that be the Congress or the state legislature or the city council, they're not always saying, you know, the city council passes an ordinance and says the road, the parks department will do this, the police department will do that, the fire department will do this. They may have other tools for actually implementing policy, right? It might be regulation, which has been a popular one in a lot of areas, including the environment. We might use subsidies. So we're trying to change things by subsidizing certain organizations to do things for government. We might impose taxes or we might give tax breaks to certain groups of people. We might use market incentives, right? So market incentives have and, and tax breaks, both those things have been used in the past to sell more fuel efficient vehicles or alternative fuel vehicles. Um, we might charge fees for specific services. So, uh, you know, we don't want people to do things. And so we charge fees for them uh, to do things. Or we want to make sure that the, the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service in our state is funded. How do we do that? We charge fees for hunting and fishing licenses. Um, we might educate, we might conduct research. Um, research grants are given to universities all the time from governments. Um, the government might provide direct services or it might contract them out or it might create some kinds of public trust. So there's very many instruments of public policy that all relate to the solution. So let me kind of jump to our problem definition assignment. And this is what's listed in um, the assignment instructions. Um, and this is due coming up in week six, so February 22nd. So what I've asked you to do is submit a three to page, three to six page double space paper. Um, you can use the APA style in-text citations. It just, I just, when you use citations, I just want to be able to find them. And, but do use citations, don't just, uh, you know, say this is a problem and, and use a bunch of information that comes from somewhere else. Um, I'm not requiring a title page. For this one, you can use the heading. Just keeping in mind that this paper here, <coughs> excuse me, becomes part of your larger paper. So, you know, start for, start thinking about formatting so that you can, so that you can merge documents. Um, so here's the real assignment. So uh, please provide the context and background of the problem and then develop a policy problem argument. So you've already submitted to me what you're writing about. Um, so, so your argument explains why the problem should be addressed. So why is this a problem? Um, and then remember you're working for a policymaker client and that policymaker might be uh, an executive like a mayor or a governor. 
uh, might be a member of the legislature, like a city council member, a senator, a member of Congress, a member of the state legislature. Uh, it might be an appointed official, like uh, the chief of police or the, the head of the fire department or the head of the parks department um, or the secretary of defense, someone like that. Um, so the exercise of identifying the client kind of helps you focus on understanding your audience. So, you know, what is really within this leader's purview? I mean, if you're asking the police chief to change a law, that person might be, you know, somewhat instrumental with the mayor to be able to do that. But are there policy issues that that police chief should be addressing within his or her purview? Um, and then what I want you to do is present adequate background so that I, the reader, or any reader can understand this policy issue and write enough so that we understand why it's a problem, why it needs to be changed. That's the assignment. Um, so based on all of our readings and, and lectures to date, you should be able to get this assignment done. Okay, so let me move on to um, this week's discussion is, and this week's discussion is really gonna be based on using the Nebraska legislature website as I noted earlier. And I'm actually gonna have a separate demo lecture on how to use their website. So please take a look at that as well. Um, so I want you to use the 106th legislature. That's the current session. So that's actually covers two years, 2019 and 2020. We're in the second half of the 106th legislature right now. Um, so I'm gonna have you look at some bills and some past laws. And here's what I want you to sort of tease out. What was the introducing senator's policy intent? What was the problem and what were its causes? How was the problem going to be solved? What were the outcomes of the policy supposed to be? And how were the outcomes going to get measured? So I want you to think about all those things that go into thinking about a policy problem. And I want you to look at some proposed bills as written and then some past laws as written. And ask yourself if you can find these things these five items that I list on this slide. Okay, so this slide shows the um, the homepage for the Nebraska legislature. You see it's just up in the address bar. It's just nebraskalegislature.gov. There's a demo um, that I'm gonna give, but I just wanna let you know what the homepage looks like. The demo is gonna show you a little more than this. So after um, you do the reading for this week, Here's, here's kind of where I want you to go with this. I want you to uh, look at the bills introduced in the current session. Again, the current session, we're on a biennial calendar. So the, two, the, the session itself, the 106th legislature, is in the second part of the session. Um, and so I want you to find some bills. So here's what I'd like you to do. And in the demo, I'm going to show you how to get to these. I want you to sample about 10 bills from the site, and they can be of your choice from any senator. I'd like you to look at about five that were passed. That would So that would be ones that were in 2019, because those were the only ones that really have had a chance to be passed and signed by the governor yet. And then I want you to look at about five that have been introduced, in that would be in 2020. And I'm going to kind of show you how to tell the difference. Um, and then I want you to read the bills and then discuss the following. Um, I'd like you to comment on, do you think whether the bills indicate that there was some policy problem? And what was that policy problem? Some of the bills include things called statements of intent and fiscal notes. I'm going to show you those in the demo. And so the question is, do those actually help you to suss out what the policy problem was? And then I kind of want you to discuss whether there is clarity or ambiguity in the bills. And finally, was it easier to understand the problem that this bill seeks to remedy for past bills versus introduced bills? And, and why might that be? So again, please contact me if you have any issues and thank you for your participation.